if you find something in, in your life that's not agreeable with the way you're being treated as a human being, human rights, then speak up. We spoke up. We spoke out. We decided that we had enough. There was very few black people that didn't suffer any racial uh, problems with white folks in Selma. The relationship between black and whites were, the whites were in control of everything and the blacks were subject to their control. Your kid and the Klan has paraded your neighborhood and burn crosses in your neighborhood. You can hear them coming because they're honking their horns and making a lot of noise and you run in the house and you hide under the bed and grandma locks the doors and turns all the lights off. That was my childhood. They come to your house, they knock on the door. The white people, the police, it didn't matter. They tell you to come on, it was over with. The people would never see you no more. We lived in a, in a, in a state of fear. The magic word. Power. And when you have power, you in control. The white people had the power to vote, so they had the power to elect whom they wanted to. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. We knew that the way to freedom was through the ballot box. The state of Alabama initiated all of these barriers to the registrar's office. You know, when they go up there to register, they would tell them, count the number of jelly beans in this jar. And of course, you had the literacy test, and you had the grandfather clause, you had the poll tax. You know, all kind of things that would deter them from one to register. Ms. Tab, how many times have you taken the test? I've taken it six times. Do you think uh, you passed it this last time? I think I passed every time. They say I failed to answer one or two questions, but they didn't say what questions. Well, the only questions they asked you were your name and address. Right. Dallas County Voters League was a group who were pursuing a voting rights movement before there was a national voting rights movement. They were actually the people on the ground here in Selma and Dallas County. These were some brave folk. To familiarize ourselves with the application. It had to be done. Amelia Boynton was the first to volunteer. She wanted freedom. She talked about freedom. We sang freedom. I remember one of her favorite songs was, Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Over me. She said, over you. I remember her courageousness. She was very outspoken. I remember when I went out with them trying to canvas to get people registered to vote. Many of them wouldn't even open their doors. Many African Americans during that time worked for white people. They couldn't participate in the movement because the whites would fire them. When I first went to get my assignment to be a SNCC organizer, the blackboard had an X on Dallas County, Selma. They said that the white folks were too mean and the black folks were too scared. I said, my goodness, I'll take it. If people don't expect anything to happen, how can you lose? <laughs> In 
Don Lafayette came to our school and he initiated the whole thing. When they came in, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, they were working with the Dallas County Voters League, those folks who were already on the ground. And when I first met Mrs. Boynton, that was the thing that convinced me that it was possible to have change in Selma because of that commitment. He knew he could not get the adults in Selma to march and organize. But he said, well, the kids don't work for anybody. We didn't have to worry about whether we got fired. So it was easier for him to organize us than it was to organize the adults. So what you have to do as an organizer is you look for leadership among the people. It was their movement, and they had to take charge. One day, they just say, hey, we're marching. And everybody started running out of the classrooms. I was 11 years old, but I had an older brother that was in high school that was 17 years old. And so when I got to school in my class, I was just sitting near the window, and once they passed the elementary school, then I would go and join the high school students, and we'd all go over to the picket line. We couldn't vote, and we didn't really know a lot. But what we were doing is support our parents because there was so much fear in this community. You just look around one time, this way, that way, look in front of you and behind you, or oh, we were all kids. I remember an incident, we were walking out one day, we was marching, and the superintendent came to the school with the mayor, and the superintendent walked up to my principal. So he walked up to him, and he slapped the principal, and said, you need to get these niggas back in school. And, and we turned around, everybody was, went to looking like, oh my God. Uh, older people have a tendency to think more, think about the consequences, and, and and all of this, as teenagers, they can't worry about no consequences. This is all they know is let's go. We had school, this was school, but it was a different type of school. We met every morning at the church, either Brown Chapel or First Baptist. You started off with singing and praying, and then it developed into various people speaking about why we need to vote. In case you wanted to march, you were taught safety precautions, how to protect yourself in case of violence, and you can't be a part of the movement unless you promise you're going to be nonviolent. It kept us together, give us a sense of purpose, gives us a sense of knowing that we, we're going to overcome all of this. God's going to see us through. One thing I can say about being around Dr. King is that there was never any fear. He made us realize so much about ourselves and who we were and what we could do. We've had in our area here outside agitation groups of all levels. We've had Martin Luther King, uh, King pardon me, sir, Martin, Martin Luther King. I think the thing that attracted Dr. King to Selma was the opposition. If we can just get rid of the outside agitators, I think we can go back to our normal way of living. I am a segregationist. 
told the people of Selma, I have never done anything behind the people of Selma's back. I will never do. I said, I will And Dr. King decided that if you come to Selma and elevate the movement here in Selma along with the local people that was already working, that Sheriff Jim Clark would overreact to the movement being elevated here in Selma and that that overreaction would attract the national media's attention. And it played out almost the way Dr. King had envisioned it. We pushed our pan, we pushed our duck. It got so where we told our teachers, said, look, said, we've done all we can do, what are y'all planning on doing? And it got to a point where the teachers knew that if they were to maintain the dignity uh, in themselves and in the classroom, they had to do something because they knew the, the gravity of what was happening outside of the classroom. The Board of Registrars is not in session this afternoon as you went for them beforehand. The day of the teachers' march, and I felt proud. You could see them standing firm, like they were, like we had taught them how to be nonviolent. It was amazing. And so they, when they, when they came out and participated in the march, we really went out there. That, that really fired us up. You cannot beat down justice, and we will register to vote because as citizens of these United States, we have the right to do it. This courthouse does not belong to Sheriff Clark. This courthouse belongs to the people of Dallas County, and these are the people of Dallas County, and they have come to register. And we're willing to be beaten for democracy, and you misuse democracy in the street. You beat people bloody in order that they will not have the privilege to vote. You beat me in the side and then hide your blows. At 11 years old, I got put in jail two times, marching for the right to vote. Sheriff Jim Clark, they would contact the schools to use the school buses, and then once they got everything in place, they would pull the buses up in front of the courthouse, and everybody that was standing out on the sidewalk in line, they would load them on the school bus. After you were fingerprinted and mugshot, we were placed jail cells tight as sardines in a can. They were stacked 10 or 12 kids in a four-man cell. We were sleeping on the floor. We slept on top of one another. We had to drink water out of the commode. First night I went in there, I was really scared. And then you heard this strong voice come out and say, We shall overcome. And then everybody would start singing it. Our mother, she was so supportive. But she worried. Only way she would know anything was through the neighborhood. And you hear things, people's, you know, but what, did you hear they locked them all up today? The main thing they wanted to hear was, did anybody die? As long as they didn't hear that, they were all right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. This is Chief of Police. I am speaking for myself and Sheriff Lawson, Sheriff of Bay County. Everybody was there at the Zion Church that night that uh, Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed. There were young people, older people, everybody there in that church that night. But they put out all the lights in Marion. They deputized all of the whites that they could find.
He received multiple lacerations and a possible concussion. I understand by a billy club. Who hit you? State trooper, all I know. And then they started pushing and beating on me. Well, Jimmy was a hard worker, mild manner, and he would give you the shirt off his back. He wasn't a violent person. And the night that he was shot, he was protecting his mother and his grandfather. They was being beaten, and he was trying to protect them. Several people began to really talk that we need to take a coffin of Jimmy Lee Jackson to the state capitol, not only to protest the murder, but to petition for our voting rights. And somehow that took hold. I am a old pilgrim of sorrow, tossed in this wide world alone. We're marching today to dramatize to the nation, dramatize to the world, that hundreds and thousands of Negro citizens of Alabama, but particularly here in the Blackfield area, denied the right to vote. It was cold that morning, by Alabama standards. Sometimes you just get a feeling. It sound like the air just don't move anymore around you. That's the feeling that we had that morning when we crossed that bridge. It was thick. It was so quiet. And we knew this time is different. Hi, what is that calling? My blood runs so chilling, so slow. I was down on the ground, trying to breathe, and I could hear people running. I could hear ladies and kids screaming, and troopers on the speaker. And just about when I couldn't take it anymore, I lifted my head, and a posse man with a billy club knocked me out. On the Water Avenue side, I stopped, dead in my tracks. I saw my baby sister in this man's arms. She looked like she was dead. I was 14 years old, thinking that I had gotten my sister killed because I was supposed to be taking care of her. Bloody Sunday. It's terrible. But that's another day that I was proud to be part of. My grandmother always taught me if you start something, you had to be determined to finish it, no matter what the end was. The feeling was, no matter what happens, this world has to change. We just determined that we were going to do what we needed to do. I remember feeling so proud just to see that many people. The atmosphere was joy. You know, it was togetherness. Something the Lord had put together. You know, you're talking about 25,000 just everyday people. That's pretty amazing. You don't have to be extraordinary to change the world. You lose your fear, you gain your courage, you attach yourself to something bigger than yourself. You marched into history, you freed a nation, and you inspired the world.
Americans who crossed this bridge, they were not physically imposing, but they gave courage to millions. They held no elected office, but they led a nation. They marched as Americans who had endured hundreds of years of brutal violence, countless daily indignities, but they didn't seek special treatment, just the equal treatment promised to them almost a century before. When it feels the road's too hard, when the torch we've been passed feels too heavy, we will remember these early travelers and draw strength from their example. 